Avram Avinu. Abraham is considered the founding patriarch of the Jewish people. It all began with him. And it culminated that it was finally confirmed without any doubt, never to be retracted with the Arcado. The Arcado was the ultimate confirmation that the Jewish people will be an eternal people due to the merit of the Arcado, the binding of Isaac, and the 10 tests which he proved his special love for God, that there was nothing too difficult, no challenge too overwhelming for him, that he gave it his all, and he was totally negated to God's will. The Torah tells us, why is Avrob so special? And the Torah uses the word Ekev. Ekev ashashoma Avrob bekoli. Torosoi umishmarti. He listened, to, he heeded my voice, my Torah in the plural, and Mishmarosai, and my fences. So the Talmud tells us that Avram Avinu had kept the Torah in entirety, even before it was given. The written law, the oral law, and even the rabbinic fences, such as Eruvi Tavshilin that unless you prepare something to remind the person that Shabbos is coming, if you have the festival on Friday followed with the Shabbos, rabbinically you're not permitted to cook or do any level of preparation. Unless you do this, create this rabbinical mechanism which allows you. I'm not going to get into this right now. Even that he kept. Every aspect of spirituality of the future, Avram Avinu had observed meticulously even before he was commanded. The only mitzvah he was commanded additional to the seven Noahide laws was the mitzvah of circumcision, which came about at the age of 99. But pre-99, before he was that, he already kept the Torah and the tidy. How do we know? Because as the Torah says, Ekev HaShashoma, because Avram had kept ABC, therefore he's special, and therefore he's the future. Now, the numerical value of Akev, we know we always to interpret the Torah, we always deal with numerical value of words, of letters, is 172. So the Talmud tells us, the Midrash tells us, that Avram already had recognized his maker. He already had abandoned paganism at the age of three years old. Because Avram Avinu only lived till the age of 175. And the Torah tells us for 172 years, he was committed to the written law, the oral law, and even the rabbinic fences. So that means three at the age of three, Avram already recognized that God is the creator, God is the maker, God is the maintainer. Is divine providence. He already recognized that's three. So, you know, we'll, we'll ask, what does a three year old child know? But we, if you read the story of Eliezer seeking a wife for Yitzchak of Inu, there's a story of Rivka. And he'd given all the signs and the indicators who is the wife who's qualified to be the future matriarch. And all of a sudden, he sees this young maiden going out, drawing water, putting in the trough, so on and so forth. He approaches her. And not only did she offer water to Eliezer, it was to his men, to his camels. How old was Rivka at the time? She was three years old. At that time, she was only three years old. I mean, physically, how could a three-year-old girl even engage in such intelligent conversation with Eliezer? Because even the conversation she had with him indicated a level of of, of intellect, which was superior intellect. And physically, how was she able to, to even attend to the chores that she had done? To draw the water, pour the water, and to draw this kind of water in volume-wise, 
were dealing in those days, people were different dimensions of being. As we find pre-Great Flood, people lived endless years, 800 years, 900 years. It was a different dimension of existence. In the time of Avraham Avinu, a three-year-old child was not a three-year-old child. Physical development, mental development was a different reality. We see that from Rivka. Avraham Avinu, at the age of three, already had the acuity, he had the capacity to be able to process and analyze, and based on his analysis of his reality, he came to the conclusion that paganism is baseless and there's only one maker. There's only, and this is how we came to monotheism. At the age of three, let's say it would have been the age of 40, at the age of 50, it doesn't make a difference, but it happened to be he was at the age of three. So there's an obvious question to ask. Was Avram the most intelligent, the smartest person in the world? Because the Midrash tells us he was born into a world that was devoid of God's presence. There are very few people believe in God, and they only believe in God because it was part of their tradition. For instance, Shem, the son of Noah, was alive when Avram was born. He passed away when Avram was, was an adult. Shem believed in God. Shem was the son of Noah, who was a tzaddik. But how did Shem, how was he aware of God's presence? Did he come upon it himself? It's only because he witnessed the pre-flood, during the flood, and post-flood, and he was a prophet. That's how we understood he was a god. But Avram was born to Terach, his father. As we mentioned the other day, he was an idol maker. He was born in a pagan society. Nimrod was the king. He's the one who had cast him into the fiery kiln because he would not bow to the idol. How? So what did Avram have? A certain degree of understanding and insight that he was able to extract from existence that this could only come about through a monotheistic being, an almighty, and it's not various deities and powers which together existence came about. How did he come upon this? He definitely was not necessarily the most, the greatest genius who ever walked the face of the earth. Shlomo Melch, we know, as it says, he was the wisest man who ever lived. Avram was not the wisest man who ever lived, but he had evidently, but he had something which no one else had. And, that, and as a result of that, he was able to come upon God, which no one else did. How's it? Why? It's an obvious question. The Midrash tells us that Avram looked at creation, looked at the world. It's a phenomenal world. You know, people, you live in urban areas, you see skyscrapers, and sometimes you walk by, drive by them. 75 story, the architecture is beautiful today, you know, the glass and the metal and the shapes, it's, it's like very impressive. And we're taken aback, you say, you know, the genius of that architect who was able to put this together, whether it was him, an individual or a team, whatever it was, it's magnificent and it's impressive. And when the sun shines and the way it reflects off the glass and the metal, it's an entity of beauty. That's man, that's man-made. And if you go out to certain parts of the world and you see nature, you see the species, you see the pristine purity of creation, like you're amazed. There's a famous word from Rabbi Shinshul for Hirsch that a Jew, if you want to believe in God, he lived in Germany, you should go to the Swiss Alps. If you go to the Swiss Alps and you see the Alps, there's no way you could deny God, that God is the creator because such a beautiful, magnificent creation only God is able to do. And the way the heaven meets earth with the mountains and the snow and everything else. And search, people say, I was never to Hawaii, that you see over there the lush 
vegetation and the everything that's there with the ocean, how it all comes together. It's, it's magnificent. The beauty of nature, it's breathtaking. And wherever you look, and Avram had a profound understanding of many things. Avram sees a creation and he had one question. Who is the master of this universe? Who brought this magnificent, the unfathomable universe into existence? Who? And Avram was not a, a slouch. He entered into dialogue with the leading thinkers of the generation. And they all came up with positions of how it came about. Avram was not satisfied. He was not satisfied. And the Midrash uses a term. He asked the question. What was the question? Mi bala biro. He sees a citadel. Has a thousand, ten thousand rooms. Every room is illuminated. Fully functional. And he asks, who is the master of the citadel? And he asks the question. And guess what? He gets no response. And just keeps asking the question. Me, Balabiro. Who is the master of the citadel? And he goes and asks this question to Nimrod. Who's the man? The king who ultimately threw him into the kiln? Because he would not bow to the idol. And he had the discussion with his father. And his father was disgusted with him. He says, go speak to the king. Go speak to the leading theologians of the, of the, of, of the generation. He did. He wasn't satisfied with their answers. So the question is, why was he satisfied? And they were satisfied. If he had good points and he poked holes in the positions and the positions were, were, were not cogent and compelling as they believed they were, so why didn't they somehow take on Avram's position? And ask the same question. Mi Balabiro. Who's the master of this magnificent citadel? This unfathomable level of genius. Who? Avram was not satisfied. But they somehow, they were satisfied. They were minimally complacent. They were okay with it. To the point that if you didn't accept their position, they will destroy you. As they did, they attempted to destroy Avram Avinu. Because he was convinced that there is a monotheistic being and he challenged them and they would not back down from their position. Later, when his nephew Lot was taken captive by the four kings, the four mightiest kings of the world, why did they take Lot captive? They had an interest in Lot. They only wanted to bait Avram because they saw and they knew he was a fanatical zealot. He would go to war to save his nephew. And that would be give them a chance to kill him and to be killed in battle. And once and for all, we'll silence his voice. We'll take him out. But little did they know that they were going to lose the battle and he was the victor. He defeated miraculously, as we'll discuss later, how that came about, the victory, miracles which are unheard of, and single-handedly, because he had God's backing, he destroyed all of them. But even after he was the victor, did the world embrace monotheism? The world did not become a monotheistic world. So why Avram, at the age of three, threw his questions his analysis of reality, he could not accept what they said, although he heard what they said. And they defended their positions, but he felt it wasn't sufficiently compelling. And therefore, he would not accept it. And he kept, and he asked the question, Mi Balabiro, who's the master of this citadel? And the question is, why for him it was not sufficient and for them it was sufficient? That's the question. We find in the Torah, there is one obligation that once a year, a Jew, if you live in Israel, you have to 
express and declare your debt of gratitude to God. And that's through the midst of bringing the new fruits and the new grains. That once a year, from the festival of Shuas going till Sukkot, you must bring the species of Israel that grow there, bring it to the Temple Mount, give it to the Kohen, and there's a verbal declaration that he must make to declare his debt of gratitude to God that, and he recounts the history from Yaakov Vinu fleeing from his father-in-law, Lavan, and how he was miraculously saved, how we went to Egypt, how we were redeemed from Egypt, and how we finally come to the promised land. And this is the produce of the land that you gave us, that you've given us. That's a declaration of our debt of gratitude to God. And that's an obligation. Once a year, if you have a piece of land in Israel and you have that produce, that is your obligation must travel to the Temple Mount and bring those new fruits or the new grain. What is debt of gratitude? Debt of gratitude is, as a person, when he borrows money, you're a debtor. And there's no justification not to address that debt. Because if you borrowed, you owe. There it's understood because the person only lent you on the condition that you pay. So that's understood. And even that, people shirk their responsibilities, even when they're true debtors, when the initial the, the debt was created due to the borrower incurring the debt and agreeing to the debt. Even there, people somehow try to evade and not pay that debt. So now we live lives and you believe in God and you believe God wills and provides every amenity of life your health, your intelligence, your possessions, the world, your ability to function, period, from A to Z. Everything is provided by God. And we all know nobody wants to die. As bad as people's situations may be, as dire as they may be, we try to work it out somehow. So if that's the case, we definitely, clearly, why are we thankful? Why don't we have that sense of gratitude rooted in the indebtedness to God? We should be grateful. But how many people have seen God's praises because of, their, of the gratitude and the indebtedness they have to God? We don't see it. Why? Because everybody has their own way of seeing why things are the way they are even though we believe it, but it doesn't somehow resonate. It's not something in our conscience. It's not in the forefront of our minds. We're not touched by it. If you're not touched by it, you don't sense the debt. And if you don't sense the debt, there is no gratitude. That's the reality of life. Every very special person, to have that level of gratitude, to be so grateful, that until you somehow reciprocate at some level to show your gratitude, you can't, you're not left at peace. It has to be done. I told over a story. It was a great tzaddik who he was a major person who disseminated Musa thought a Jewish perspective. His name was Rabbi Elio Dessler. He at one time was Mashgiach. He was the dean of men in Pont of the Yeshiv in Israel, but he lived many years in England, many, many years in England, pre-World War II, during World War II. And his son, he had a son and a daughter, during the war, his son, his daughter, and his wife were in Melbourne, Australia. And his son was studying in Yeshiva in Europe, in Tells. It was a community in Lithuania called Tells. And he had come to the United States. 
and he was all by himself. And there was a rabbi who lived in Cincinnati. His name was Rabbi Leza Silver, who he had known from Europe. And Rabbi Leza Dessler was a grandson of Rabbi So Salanter. There's a book that was translated and it was published called Strive for Truth, three volume work on Jewish perspective. It's worthwhile to get. And everything wasn't translated, but there are many things written still in the original in the Hebrew text of his perspective. And Rebbe Leza Silver literally took him on as almost like a son. And he gave him that sense of welcomeness, support, whatever he needed, he was available to him. He was a great rabbi in Cincinnati, tremendous Talmud Chochem. And Rebbe Leza Dessler had seen his sons from before the war, and he came to the United States in the early 50s. And he called, he came to New York City, and he calls up Rabbi Silver in Cincinnati, he says, I would like to come to visit you. Is it okay? He says, of course it's okay. He had no idea why he wanted to see him. He already was in Israel, the head of this, the largest yeshiva in Israel, Panovich. He was the dean of men. A man like that asked to come to visit you. Says, oh, and they knew one another from before the war. Rabbi Silver already came to the United States in the early part of the 20th century. He already was here. He started off in Springfield, Mass., Springfield, Massachusetts. He was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And ultimately, he was in Cincinnati. So he travels in those years. He traveled by train from New York City to Cincinnati. The course, the time, and the effort. He wasn't a youngster at the time. He comes to Rabbi Silver's house, takes a taxi, is dropped off, and Rabbi Silver's happy to see him. And right away, you know, they have small talk. They sit down, and he, Rabbi Silver says to Rabbi Dester, evidently you made this trip. There must be something very important that you have to tell me that you want to discuss with me. He says, no. He says, I came to say thank you for attending to my son's needs when he did not have a father that you acted on my behalf. You were like the surrogate father. That's what I came to say thank you. So Rabbi Silva says to Rabbi Dessler, you could have picked up the phone, wherever you are, from Israel or from, from New York City, call me and say, Rabbi Silva, I want to thank you. I'm indebted to you for all you did for my son. It would have enough at your age to make this kind of trip, time, effort, Cost-wise, why did you do it? So Rabbi Desla says, do you know what a debt of gratitude is? Do you think it's sufficient just to make a call? To show you to what degree I appreciate what you've done for me, attending to all my son's needs as if you were his father, to give him that sense of confidence and security under no circumstance is a phone call sufficient. Therefore, I have to come, regardless of the time factor, the cost factor, my health factor, didn't make a difference. If you speak to us, and you speak to any average, ordinary person, it doesn't make any sense what he say. The phone call would have been enough. I will give, give an example. Person graduates business school and he needs a position, and he knew someone when he was younger, who's a rainmaker in Wall Street. And he calls him up and he says to him, I just graduated business school. I need a very serious recommendation. Could you make a recommendation for this particular firm? He says, it'd be my pleasure. Calls, they hire immediately. This person takes off, succeeds. And 20 years later, the one who originally made the, the recommendation falls in hard times. He has serious reversals and he needs, he needs some kind of assistance, not money. Favor, pick up the phone, put a good word in to a certain firm. 
And this person, he himself became a rainmaker. This young person calls him up. He says, could you make the call for me? He says, I'm sorry, can't. I can't burden people. I can't impose myself to people. So the person says to him, do you remember when you graduated business school, you asked me to make the call. I made the call. And due to that call, look where you are. So you don't think the least that you should do is make the call for me, to put a word in for me, a recommendation that I should be able to have a chance to regain my financial stability. So he says to him, he says, so what did the call cost? It took you, what did it take you? Three minutes? The call cost you 10 cents? I'll give you back your 10 cents. I'll give you the three minutes. You understand? This person was the beneficiary of this person. The man should come and kiss the, the floor, the ground which the man walks. And the man doesn't understand beyond a 10 cents phone call and a few minutes. It only took you three minutes. It wasn't a big deal. The person owed it to you. What did you do for me? What do you mean what I do for you? But unfortunately, most people don't get it. But a person who have and feel that debt of gratitude, and he feels he's truly a debtor, not the man did it initially because he wants you to be his debtor. He did it out of the goodness of his heart. But you factually are beneficiary of his kindness. How do you not reciprocate? The answer is most people, even if they have a sense of gratitude, it's not to the degree that most people that will willing to put themselves on the line. If there's going to be a serious cost factor, they're not willing to do it. They're not willing. You have to be a special person to internalize the value of your benefit to reciprocate at a level, regardless of what the cost factor may be. You have to be a special level. But what about to have a sense of indebtedness that you're willing to give your life and commit your life and dedicate your life for your benefactor, what level of gratitude do you need? To what, what's the depth of that debt that a person has to internalize to be able to respond to that indebtedness and dedicate your life to that? This is something that doesn't exist, almost doesn't exist. Avram Avinu, as a young boy, he looks at this world, his, his old self, his physicality, his health, his understanding, all the endless endowments that he's endowed with, it didn't come out of a vacuum. He looks at the world, the beauty, the genius, the symmetry, the balance. How did this all come about? There is a benefactor. I, as a human being, am a beneficiary of that benefactor. Who is that benefactor? Why does he want to know who the benefactor is? And that's what he said. Me Balabiro, who is the master of the citadel? Every room in that citadel is functional, burning, illuminated. There's someone who's causing all this continuously. Who is he? Because if I'm going to reciprocate and dedicate my life, which is the payment of the debt, which is a pittance in terms of what it is, I'm only going to reciprocate and pay homage to the one who's truly my benefactor. Unless he's my benefactor, I'm not going to dedicate my life, which is everything I am. It's only the one who truly has given me everything. Therefore, regardless of all the dialogues that he entered into with all the great thinkers of generation, he wasn't satisfied with their answers. As I always say, there are two kinds of answers when you ask a question. Sometimes the person asks you a question, you give them an answer, and the person says, you know, I think I could live with that answer. I could live with that answer. Avram was not interested in being able to live with that answer. He wanted to know the answer. Who is the benefactor? If I'm going to give my life and dedicate my life, not die, but mean every moment of my existence, I'm going to actually perpetuate and magnify God's existence in this world. Whoever that benefactor is, it better be the right one. So unless I'm convinced that he is the benefactor, and I am the beneficiary of that, I don't buy it. If everyone else, because they didn't have the depth and breadth of gratitude and didn't sense the indebtedness, they were able to live with, with the answers they had, with the positions they took on. Avramovina couldn't. So if that's the case, 
If everyone rejected Avram, how did Avram come upon the truth? So the Midrash says, he kept asking the question. He kept rejecting all the positions, all the leading pagan leaders. And he says, Mi Balabira, who is the master of this creation? Until finally, God himself comes to Avram and says, Ani Balabira. I am the master of this existence. I am the creator. He communicated with Avram. So Avram did not find God himself. But due to Avram not willing to accept anything unless it was 100% confirmed that he's the benefactor, Avram's not going there. So what, what drove Avram to reject and only embrace what is truth? Avram had such a quest for truth. Truth is unadulterated truth. It's not I could live with the answer. I guess I could live with that. He wasn't interested in taking the edge off the question. Because the question is annoying. So as long as you dull it a little bit, you can live with it. Avram wanted to know the truth. God's signet is truth. God is the source of truth on the absolute level. Because Avram Avinu was not willing to compromise his standard of truth. The source of all truth comes to Avram and says, Anibal Abir, I am the master of the city. So that's how Avram came upon God. So it's very interesting. Very often, we do things that we're convinced. And when things go awry, we start second-guessing ourselves. Maybe it's not what we thought. We're convinced not. Avram Avinu could never, ever think differently than the reality that God is the master. Because it's not something he figured out. It's not due to his analysis he came upon God. Due to his analysis and his depth of reality of being indebted to whoever that is, he rejected all the positions. But why did he believe in God? That God was the monotheistic being. Because God himself came to himself and says, I am the master. So that's irrefutable fact. No matter what, God is the master. So everything I have, everything I do, everything I'm exposed to, is due to God's beneficence. And if that's the case, what's my level of indebtedness? I owe my whole life to God. Because not only do I owe my life now, because every moment God wills existence, I'm a continuous beneficiary of that. So Avram, when it came to a sense of gratitude, he was unequaled. We'll see in the history of the world, he was unequaled. Because it was only due to that, even at the risk of his life, did it make a difference. He will die. He will not accept anything that's not truth. Even to be thrown into the kiln. If I know the truth, and I know who my bad victor is, I'm not singing the praises and offering homage to anything which is false. I always mention, we say every morning in the Shachris, in the Birchus Krishma, right after Sukkot Zimra, first blessing, we say, So the word Rabu could even mean, how numerous are your actions, God? They all came about through great wisdom. Or How profound, we're not talking about quantitative, how profound are your actions? It's a level of profoundness. It's unequaled at any level of genius. It surpasses any genius. It's a level of chokhmah, of wisdom. It's unequaled, unparalleled to any degree. That's what we're saying. If there are no two fingerprints which are identical, if there are no two snowflakes which are identical, and there are endless things in creation which are unfathomable, and you, you combine them. We're talking about something which is beyond, beyond, beyond. I was just reading. I just mentioned Hawaii before. The main island in Hawaii, there's a volcano. The concern, it's going to erupt. 
the lava flow, the degrees of earthquakes on top of the mountain, it, the tremors, and what it could bring, what it could bring about. We're talking molten rock, molten rock, and what feeds it. There's a whole underground system of, that's based in the core of the earth with this molten rock and it flows. It's like you have underground water sources. You have a water table. You have underground molten rock. And what causes it to erupt? They don't know, but they, they, they know. Was the tremors, the whatever, but what causes it? They don't know. This is, but for God, what is this? It's meaningless. In a second, the whole island could be devastated. The tsunami in Asia, when it came, blink of an eye, in and out, the ocean came in, the ocean went back. It's as if existence didn't exist. A blink of an eye, relatively speaking. What does it mean to God? It means nothing. Nothing. The power of the ocean. We just read about the great flood. Within a short period of time, there was no existence. Everything came to an end. So thou that you live, we find very interesting. We just read about the Tower of Babel. After the great flood, only Noah and his three sons survived and their wives. So the future existence are descendants of the three sons of Noah. The three sons of Noah understood that the world was destroyed because God destroyed the world because their behavior was unacceptable. He gave them every chance to make corrections. They were defiant. He brought the world to an end. We're starting over again. New chance. The people who built the Tower of Babel, the objective of that project was to rebel against God. That's what, That was the objective. So the Torah tells us the Bnei Odom, the Bnei Odom built the tower. They gathered with this plan to build the Tower of Babel. They're called the sons of Adam. Bnei Odom means human beings. So Rashi cites the Medrash. Are they Bnei Chamorim? Are they the sons of donkeys? Of course, they're human beings. We're talking about human beings. The gathering, because they had a certain commonality among them, they spoke the same language. They understood one another. We're going to jointly join to have this rebellion against God. The Bnei Odom. So Rashi cites the Midrash. The Midrash says, just as Adam, after he ate of the tree of knowledge, and God says, what did you do? He says, the woman who you gave me, just as Adam was an ingrate, their behavior, they're no different than Adam. They're all ingrates. If they all understand that initially it was a great flood and God gave them another chance to start, a new, start the world over again, and you exist and you succeed only because of his beneficence, where's the gratitude? You're all ingrates. They're demonstrating the same flaw in character that Adam had, identically. It's rearing its head again. That's what they refer to as neodom. Every human being has a certain defect to some degree in his genealogy. It's called ingrate. The Jews themselves, the 40th year in the desert, after having the man of 40 years, miracle food, sustaining them, they come up with this crazy idea, you know? If we haven't evacuated, we haven't relieved ourselves for 40 years, you know something? It's a ploy of God. Eventually, all this food will expand in our intestines and we're going to die. We think it's the ultimate kindness. It will expand because how could it not? Whoever heard of ingesting and the body doesn't expel it. You know what's going to happen? We're going to die. So what does God do? God sends the vipers. And they were bitten. And they started to die, the Jews. That was the wake-up call. And the Talmud says, Kriyitova b'nei Kriyitova. You're ingrates who descend from an ingrate. Adam was the first ingrate. This kind of 
processing and putting it and seeing it through that lens, that's the lens of an ingrate. Rather than seeing it as the ultimate. Kindness, what I'm doing for you, you tell me I'm what? I'm out to destroy you. So ingrate is literally the antithesis of be grateful. Ingrate. It's the inverse of gratitude. Every person has it to a degree. To be able to develop it, or to dispel it, I should say, and to expand and deepen one's sense of gratitude, to be appreciative, it needs a continuous, continuous reflection and a certain degree of humility because paying a debt is not easy. <clears throat> we all want to do what we want to do. So it's a combination of many things. The recognition is based on your level of humility. What's it all about? Is it me or it's doing the right thing outside of me? Avram had a, a level of depth and breadth of gratitude, a capacity which was unequaled. <clears throat> Therefore, although he didn't have the answer, he rejected every position of paganism because he knew that was not the answer. He has to reciprocate. He has to dedicate his life to whoever his benefactor is. <clears throat> and only once he rejected everything and he kept persisting with that question, who is the master of the universe? Who's the master of the citadel? Only then did God come himself and say, I am the master. Because he was not willing to compromise truth. The source of all truth communicated with him says, I am the source of everything. I am God. I am the master. I am the creator. From that point on, Avram, Avram soared for 172 years. The written law, the oral law, every rabbinic fence, not to violate the will of his benefactor. That's the level of clarity he had. So let's talk about the test, which many of the opinion it was the first test he was tested. Leave your home, your land, your birthplace, your family, and go to the location that I will show you. He was unaware even where he was going. And he picks himself up leaves. He was able to meet the challenge. So the obvious question is, we alluded to it last week, what was Avram's relationship with his countrymen, the location of his birthplace, with his father? Every one of them wanted to eat him alive, to destroy him and to send him into oblivion that there should not be a trace of his existence. That, that's, it culminated with Nimrod, giving him the ultimatum, you bow or you die, go into the fiery kiln. His own father informed them, gave him over to be killed. So God says, pick yourself up and leave your countrymen. Avram was a fugitive for 13 years. He hid in a cave from his countrymen. Everybody was looking high and low for him. They couldn't locate him. He was hunted. Even his closest peers who he grew up with, his birthplace, his family. You'd like, if we were told such a thing as Abram, you'd run for your life. It's the ultimate life's opportunity. And what does God say to him? And he knows God's talking to him. You will have wealth. You will have fame. And you will have children. Because the Torah told us in this week's reading at the end of Noah, Sarai was an Akora. Sarai was a barren woman. She couldn't have children. And Avram understood who Sarai was, his wife. Besides her physical beauty, as it says, she was one of the most beautiful women who has ever, ever walked the face of the earth in terms of her devoutness, her holiness. 
He understood she could be the future matriarch of the Jewish people, but she was barren. God says, when you go to the land I will show you, you will have children. You know what this is? To be able to produce progeny which will carry on your mission. And you can have wealth. Right now, we didn't have enough anything. You'll have fame. There where you are, you're a pariah. You're despised. There, you'll be extolled. You'll be having like a magnetic force to whoever will be exposed to you. What kind of test is this? But yet, nobody disagrees. Going into the kiln, it's questionable. Among the early commentators, whether that was one of the 10 tests. But leave your homeland, your birthplace, and your family. Nobody argues that definitely was one of the 10 tests. But according to our understanding, what a test is, what's the test? The answer is for us, definitely would not be a test. Not a test whatsoever. If a person, God forbid, was in Auschwitz and he was subject to the torture and everything else that the person witnessed there through the demonic behavior of the Nazis, Yemach Shemom Zichrom, they should be obliterated forever and be suffer a level of divine retribution which is unheard of. They are not the first ones, there are many behind them. And you told and guaranteed you're going to be taken to a safe refuge to begin a new life and not to experience any of what you had in the past. We wouldn't run, we'd flee. Blink of an eye, you'd be out of there. Here, Avram understands God is speaking to him. It's a prophecy. Wealth, fame, children. And yet, it's a test. What context is it a test? But as we explained it, your father gave you over to be killed because you destroyed the idols. Why, why did Terah do that? Because since Terah believed that the deity was his God, he did something which sacrilegious, intolerable. Avraham Avinu believed it was only because it was a misunderstanding. If his father would understand truth, and he feels if he could convince his father and bring him to truth, his father would regret his behavior. It's only because of this misunderstanding, not understanding what Avram understands, his countrymen, the members of his community, his peers. It's all based on what? On its mistaken identity. That's what it's all about. But if they would understand who Avram really is and who he's representing, they would embrace him. Now, what great of debt of gratitude does Avram have to his father? As we said, if his father wouldn't have brought him into existence, biologically, would he would have had the opportunity to recognize who the master of the universe is, to have a share and be part of eternity? His debt of gratitude to his father is something not to be understood in terms of the way Avram internalized it. What about the people you grew up with, your peers, your birthplace? Even something negative, you learn from negative. It's like the Ramchal writes, what is the value of evil? The value of evil is not to do evil that you should be able to make a choice and reject evil, that's the value of evil, purely for the sake of rejection. Because when you appreciate evil, then you do good. The value even of those who disagreed with him, his countrymen, part of his growth and development was due, were a composite of our, all our experiences in life. Savram so felt he has a debt of gratitude to even those who were always opposed to him those who pursued him, the culture of the land he was born in, that identity, everything contributes 
to his makeup, to his development, to who he is today. So Avram Avinu held that his debt of gratitude to his father is the ultimate. To those, his peer group is to a lesser degree. To his countrymen, less, but to all of them, he has an unlimited debt of gratitude because he is only what he is. Because all the interactions and all the experiences of his life, therefore he has a debt of gratitude. God says, you know something? Pick yourself up and leave. If a person knows he's a debtor and he's turning his back on A, B, and C, where you're so overwhelmed and overweighted with his debt and you live it and you breathe it, how could you leave that? How could I abandon them? Where I believe, I feel, I have the ability to make a difference. God says, and I gave the example, the flask of perfume in a cemetery. God says, it's like having a flask of perfume in a, in a cemetery. As fragrant as that perfume may be, because the people are corpses, they don't have the capacity to be able to benefit from the fragrance. These people have no capacity for spirituality. Regardless of what you believe, you're not going to make a difference. But we all believe we have what it takes. So what was the test to leave? The test to leave was, give me another chance. Since I have such an overwhelming feeling of death to these people, let me try to pay part of that debt. God says, it's futile. It's like we say, in the, it's like beating a dead horse. Nothing. The moment God says nothing, picks himself up on the moment, leaves. That was the test. The test of the Akedah was only a test because of the degree of the capacity and depth and breadth of Avram's gratitude for him. It was overwhelming, the test. But despite the overwhelming feeling of gratitude, God says, no, it's no, he's out. He's out of the door. Give you an equivalent example. We don't have that. Of course we don't. We can't even relate to Rabbi Dessler's debt of gratitude for Rabbi Silva did for his son that a phone call wouldn't have been sufficient. He had it to show because he couldn't hold himself back. Person, you borrow money, a tremendous amount of money from a certain person. And you know, you owe him the money. He even has a documents saying that you owe them the money. Then afterwards you have a disagreement with them. And you feel, you know, because he's who he is, I'm not paying the debt. What does the disagreement have to do? If he, it's a financial disagreement and he owes you the amount of money that that debt is, is one thing. Uh, he insulted you. He could have done you a favor. I'm not paying the debt. What is him being a person who denies you a favor what does that do with the debt that you own? You have a financial debt to them. He takes the court, he'll be able to collect. Well, I'm not paying. What does not paying the debt have to do with your, your gripe and your claim and your grudge against it? It has nothing to do with it. The debt is a debt. That's a debt of gratitude. The problem is when you have that negative feeling to someone else, automatic that blots out everything. When he's doing, when the other person does for you, you're singing his praises. The moment to go south and the spigot is turned off, all of a sudden people have short memories. You're, all, you're only as good as you are at the moment. Otherwise, people, they get amnesia. But what about all he did for you? How could you forget it? Yeah, I have fond memories. Sometimes, you know, it's interesting. You go into a business deal and you offer a person sage advice to be able to succeed. And the understanding is you're going to get be compensated for your advice. And, but you didn't write a document. There was no previous agreement. 99.9% of the times, the person will give you a, a big thank you, send you a bottle of wine, send you a tie. That's it. The man made millions of dollars on the deal. Don't you think he should show his gratitude? It's understood. But it was unwritten. Well, legally, I'm not bound to you. I don't have to pay that. But how do, you, how do you not? You only made this kind of money only due to his involvement in and advised you every step of the way. How do you not? And it was understood. 
but legally I'm not bound. The answer is, but it speaks volumes of people, what people are. Because the person would truly appreciate and feel indebted, it's a debt. Document, no document. The answer is, of course, the level of indebtedness is so shallow, it's not even skin deep. If at best you get a thank you, maybe. And maybe the bottle of wine, or maybe the tie, or maybe he'll invite you to his wedding, which is black tie, and you'll have to give his son a gift, which is more than anything you can imagine. Otherwise, he won't be happy with you. 